Good morning and welcome to Free Advice Friday. My name is Carrie Barnum for New Shells Books and we are here for Free Advice Friday where we talk about publishing, marketing, and the business of being an author. We're so glad you've joined us today and you can always join us live by going to newshelves.com forward slash FAF to register. Free Advice Friday is completely free. You can also watch the replays over on YouTube, which is just New Shells Books over on YouTube. We also accept questions uh, being emailed in throughout the week, and we have a couple of those. You can email questions to info, I-N-F-O, at newshelves.com. And we're going to start with one of those questions that came in uh, by email. So one of the first questions that we had was from Linda, and the question is, when I buy a pack of 10 ISBNs, do I need to have a definite title for my uh, finished but yet unpublished book? And that is a really great question, Linda. I think a lot of people think that they can't get their ISBNs until like they're ready to put uh, push the publish button. But when you purchase your ISBNs, the only thing you need to know is if you're buying them personally or if you're sell setting up an LLC or a company of some sort to purchase them through. Um, and you just go on for the U.S., you go to myidentifiers.com, and that's going to be Valker. If you are in the U.K., you're buying from uh, Nielsen Valker over in the U.K. If you're in Canada, you actually can get ISBNs for free from your government. You just have to request them. Same for South Africa. Um, and then other countries obviously have different ways to buy their ISBNs as well. The important thing is do not buy a secondhand ISBN. It is literally in the terms of service that an ISBN cannot be transferred. So that means if you're buying an ISBN or using an ISBN from someone else, what's actually happening is they are the publisher of record. They own the print and distribution rights tied to that ISBN. You are using it, but it's technically theirs. And so we don't want to do that. It gives away part of your control because those cannot be transferred. So I would recommend that you just go over to, if you're in the U.S., myidentifiers.com and buy your ISBNs. Once you have your ISBNs, they're just in there. They sit in your account. Now, once you're ready, once you've got the book information is when you're going to assign an ISBN to a title. And at that point, yes, you do want to have your title. You should have all the basic information of your book. Now, once you submit it, it gets sent into like a big, um, it gets sent into a big database for information. Can you change your title after you've assigned an ISBN? You can, that's the good news. You can change your title. But it does take a while for that to sync up in the database, and so it can get a little bit messy. So it's good to have as close to your final title as you can get. But if you have to change your title later, it's fine. And you don't have to assign your ISBN until you are ready. So you can wait until a week before you publish to you know, fill out that ISBN information. You just need to know what the ISBN is and get the right ISBN and the right book with the right title because I've seen where people do not fill out the form for their ISBN in my identifiers right away. And then they use that ISBN for a different title and things like that. So you want to keep track. It's very important that the ISBN that you use for a book on places like KDP and Ingram Spark matches the ISBN that you've assigned to it in your Valker account or the official ISBN place, because if you um, mix those up, it can get very, very messy. And for the US, again, it is myidentifiers.com. And that is Valker. I know it's confusing that we don't just go to Valker, but it's myidentifiers.com. And I did drop that in the chat for you. So you are welcome to buy those pretty much anytime you'd like. Alrighty, a question coming in about the little logo on a website. So yes, when you update the little logo on a website, I forget what it's called, but you know, when you go and you search, I don't know, you search Facebook and it's got the Facebook logo in like the URL bar. 
Um, I don't know what that's called, but yes, if you own your site, you should be able to update that for yourself. And usually those updates take in a couple of days. So if it's not, I would question whatever host you're using um, or wherever your website may be. Um, but you should in most places. Now, if you are going through a site, like for example, uh, I think it's the Authors Guild that offers websites to their members at a discounted price, but it's like through Authors Guild big account. So you can't customize everything there because of that, because it's the Authors Guild account, not your account. And so sometimes that may be the case. So you wanna know if you own the different things so you can assign your own logos. If not, if you're going through um, kind of like a third party or someone who's you know got the main account, then you may not be able to update that. And that may be part of it. Uh, Tamara is asking, if you upload to KDP and set a future publishing date, do you have to wait to order books for yourself until your book goes live? Or can you order right away? Uh, not the watermarked author copies with that, you know, not for resale banner on them. So you cannot, when you, the point of, from what I had heard, the point of using the um, future release date option on KDP, part of that point was so you didn't have to go in and hit publish button on launch day. And part of the point was that you could order author copies prior to um, to launch, but only if you set a future release date on KDP with paperback. I will tell you, I've tried to use that feature a couple of times. If you publish your book or if you do a pre-order for your paperback through Ingram Spark, it will make your book ineligible for a future release date. They will remove it. And also I've never been able to order author copies when it, it is on um, the that thing. So. To my knowledge, you cannot order author copies until your book goes live on KDP without that banner, without that proof banner. So you would need the book to go live. And um, sometimes I have seen where people make their book live for like a hot minute, order author copies and then unpublish it. But then it shows as unpublished, not as like a pre-order. Um, I don't personally like doing that, but I know some people who've done that. And then if you are using KDP and Ingram Spark in tandem, you can order author copies of your book from Ingram Spark prior to the book being live. You can override the on sale date. So if I uploaded a book to Ingram Spark today, but it wasn't going to be published until October 22nd, I could still order author copies from Ingram Spark, they would have no proof banner or anything like that. So that is something to consider. Yes, it can be a headache for sure. All right. This next question is from Eileen. And um, it's a bit of a doozy. So I saved it. I saved it after I warmed you all up because this is quite the doozy. All right, here is the question. Um, my publisher recently sent out a message to all authors that AI cannot be used in any of their products for either text or images, saying it is an absolute legal quagmire. As, quote, outfits like ChatGPT are able to scan through the whole of the internet looking for instances of their technology being co-opted in the production of saleable material, end quote. Um, so the question is, so when I create an image using ChatGPT, who owns it? I put the images up on my website. Do I need to mention that they are AI assisted? What are the legal ramifications for using them? You know, I have to do my disclaimer here. I am not a lawyer. I do not pretend to be a lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice. I am simply discussing a topic as I understand it. So now that we've gotten that mess out of the way, let me tell you my opinions and what I know or as I understand it. As far as ChatGPT and AI or no AI, this is a hot topic in publishing and it's not going to go away. Some people 
Um, I, Jane Friedman, actually, one of her recent newsletters was a whole interview with someone who is using AI to like write entire books. They're doing like entire sections and outlines and putting books out that way very proudly. Like they're talking about it. It's not something hidden. They're using this as a writing and publishing model. So there are people who are absolutely using it. And then you have people who are so on the opposite spectrum that if you even, um, I don't know, use an AI system to improve your marketing copy, they are offended by it. And then of course, there are people in the middle who are like, oh, I can see where AI would work for some things, but then I wouldn't feel right about using it for others and blah, 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 blah. blah. And so we are, we're gonna have this for a long time because the thing, of it is, is that so much of it has not been figured out in the courts of who owns what, how does it work, how do people get paid? So at the moment, you cannot copyright an AI piece of work. If you have used AI to assist you, for example, if you're using something like, um, what are the things, pro writing aid. Technically, that's got pieces of AI, not generative AI, but it's AI. If you are using um, different things, technically it's AI, but you can use those things and you can copyright your material. Just because you put your book through Pro Writing Aid or Grammarly or something does not mean that your book's not copyrightable and you, you know, it's AI. That's not what I mean. But when you're generating things with AI, you don't actually own that image. It at the moment cannot be copyrighted unless something new has come through in the laws very, very recently. Um, it can't be copyrighted because it's not considered your work. It is the AI's work that has been trained on other people and artists' work. So I'm not talking about whether we should or should not use AI, that's for you and your conscience to decide. Um, your conscience, your business plan, all of those things. I didn't mean that in a negative way, but that's, that, I'm, not, I'm not up on this platform talking about that today. But what I am saying is that when you use it, you don't, as of the moment, technically own the right or the copyright to it. And that is why some publishers are very much staying away from it. Now, there are people who are using AI in their covers who are using, as I said, there's someone who um, is like leading this train of writing entire books with AI, but there's a lot of programs and even cover designers that are using AI for covers and different things like that. Will this be a problem down the road? That's the thing no one knows. And that is why some publishers are like, we're just staying away from it. We're not even doing that. I will say that if you use any generative AI, not not assistance AI, not pro, pro writing aid, Grammarly, not that. But if you are using generative AI in your book to generate ideas, to generate um, content, any of your wording, if you're using generative AI for your book cover or images used in your book, it is required, as far as I'm aware, on all self-publishing and print-on-demand platforms now that you mark that on your book when you're uploading it in the metadata. Amazon asks and they specify if the AI was used for the writing, for translation or for art or cover. And then they also ask you how much was it, you know, one image with some AI manipulation? Was it multiple images with some AI? Was it mostly AI, that kind of thing? And it asks you specifically. At the moment, Ingram Spark, um, I don't know if Ingram Spark goes into that much uh, detail, but Ingram Spark does now have a button as well that asks whether or not your book has AI, um, generative AI used in it. Um, so as of right now, that's just being used internally for whatever systems they're putting in place. However, my belief is one of the reasons why they're doing that. Number one is to scan that content to make sure we're seeing a lot of summary books. We're seeing a lot of low content in stolen content, honestly, on um, draft digital KDP, Ingram Spark has become a problem in all of those places. So one of the reasons why I think that is, you know, that box is required is so they can easily check it. A lot of places are pulling down summary books. Um, Barnes and Noble has done it. draft to digital is doing it. Ingram Sparks doing it. So uh, we're seeing that happen. And part of it is they are using 
they, they are ironically using some AI systems to check for that. Um, but um, the other thing is, is that it's being cataloged internally. And my belief is that they're doing that. So if the court system does decide, hey, you can use generative AI, but you need to have a notice of that on the sales site, or you need to have a notice of that, or hey, you cannot use it. You are in breach. You have to do something if you use generative AI, or if there's a big lawsuit with one of the AI companies and there's a problem there. It is my belief that the reason why they're requiring that everyone answer these questions now is so that if it's required that a notice be put on the, um, the, the sales page, click of a button and suddenly it's all there, it's all been cataloged. And so I think we'll see that later down the road. Now, the question specifically this time was, what if I'm using it for my marketing? What if I'm using it on my website? To my knowledge, again, I'm not a lawyer, to my knowledge, you can do that. You can use it on your website. You can use it um, in social media. It's very common to see AI images and different things like that. You can use it. And do you have to have a disclaimer that it was made with AI? No, you can. But to my knowledge, I don't think that you have to. Um, most of the time we can tell when AI was used because it's got a certain look about it. And so I think that you're you're probably safe using it that way, as long as you are not claiming it as your original artwork, or you're not trying to sell it or anything like that. Um, I think you're pretty safe to use it. Now, will your publisher in any way have a problem with you using those images to market your book online or on your website? Who knows? And really that's between you and them. Um, how would they even know unless they were looking? Again, how much do they want to pick that bone? I don't know. But that is one of the things that I would say. And just to give you guys, um, I mean, I'm going to pull up your website. So for those of you on the call here, you can see that this is what Eileen has done. She's got this really fun uh, book that is turning into a series where it's like humanoid characters, but they are cats and um I think cats and mice and different animals. So it's kind of this fun thing. It's an adult series, it's adult fiction, but it's got a cat little twist on it. And so she's taken these different characters and she's made them cats. So you can see the business lady with the cat head and uh, the baker here and the different things like that. So it's kind of like a very fun thing. And again, do you need to um, claim this? I don't think so. I don't think you need to have a disclaimer on there. If you're worried about it, I would absolutely put a line down here that simply says, you know, all images were uh, created using whatever AI system and just leave it at that. But I personally don't think you probably have to worry. Um, in most cases, I think it's pretty obvious that AI was probably used on these. And, you know, while they're fun and interactive, as long as you're not using them for your book cover or like you're not making a picture book or something like that. I imagine it's fine. Yeah. Um, and so that's my opinion. Now, will your publisher, if your publisher, oops, knock my whole desk over. If your publisher sees that, will they be upset that you were marketing with AI? Can't tell you that. Um, again, it depends on the size of the publisher too. Big publishers typically aren't going to even pay attention unless there's a problem or someone complains. Um, but there's no hard and fast rules. And I think that is what scares people about, um, that's what scares people about AI at the moment or using AI, not using AIs. We don't have any hard and fast rules. Even laws, um, we don't have all the laws in place yet. We have things in courts, we have ideas, we have opinions, but we don't have a law to fall back on. And that is how so many things are decided is I'm not going to do this because when I look back at this court case that was decided that set precedent, this is, you know, this is the law that was put in place or this is copyright law and different things like that. We just don't have that yet. We are literally in the middle of things being decided and made in, in the court system. And uh, that's just how it is right now.
And here, a follow-up question on AI. I used AI to create an image for a book cover a couple of years ago before Amazon was asking, do I need to go tell Amazon? Um, I personally would. I will say that before you can update a book, so like if you go in to update your description or if you go in to update anything on that book, Amazon is... Uh, last time I've been doing it is they actually require that you answer that question to update anything on the book. If you're updating keywords or description, I'm not sure about price, but I imagine probably that as well is that they are not allowing you to update and essentially republish without answering that AI question. So they are kind of forcing it slowly, even for older books for you to answer the question about AI being used. Um, and they're not penalizing anyone at the moment, to my knowledge, they're not penalizing anyone. If you used it to create a book cover or a book cover image, they have some qualifying questions. They will ask what AI system you use to create that. Again, my personal thoughts on that are, is that they want to catalog that. So if there is a problem with a specific system, company, um, software later down the road specifically, for that and AI, then they know which covers or which books to pull or look at. Um, they're just trying to protect themselves, I think, and also put things in place so that when or if AI is decided in the courts, that they can follow the rules. I mean, like right now, I don't even think it's a law. I think they're doing it mostly for customer satisfaction, but there's KDP Virtual Voice, which does the, um, the, I can't even think of my words, the AI voice. And on those sales pages, it does say this, this book was created with virtual voice. And they essentially say it's in, you know, an AI audio. And they're doing that now for customer satisfaction. I don't think they have to do it legally, but again, I'm not a lawyer. And, um, but they may in the future, it may be required. So I think they're just trying to get their ducks in order, uh, ducks in a row so that they can when the time comes. Let me see, I had another question that popped up here, let me pull it. Oops, all right. Um, I had a question about whether or not I have a training for Facebook ads and I've been getting this question a lot because I talk about Facebook ads and I love Facebook ads and I've gotten a lot of questions about whether or not I have a training or a program for Facebook ads. At the moment, I do not have a course or training on Facebook ads. And part of that is because Facebook ads keep changing. I thought about doing a program or a course um, multiple times, but they keep on changing them. So um, some of the things that were on Facebook are not allowed, allowed a month ago aren't anymore. And so it's changing so quickly. Um, I haven't taken the time to invest in a like whole Facebook thing, but I am getting a lot of questions about that. And so if there is enough interest, maybe I will do um, like a whole, like a Facebook ad training or webinar, something like that, where we walk through some of the basics of Facebook and setting up an ad um, with Facebook ads, much like Amazon ads, you can learn the basics and get an ad up in an hour. It's possible. You can take five hours to learn all the intricacies of Facebook ads. And I don't think we'd go that deep, but for anyone who may need um, kind of a look over at Facebook, at Facebook ads, if you either email me, drop it in the chat, let me know if you're interested, if there's enough interest then I will see about putting together a webinar for that. I do a lot of Facebook ad consulting. Um, I work one-on-one -on -one with authors on consulting for Facebook ads or running their Facebook ads for them. But the training, the training is just a little bit different because what I know in here um, is easier to keep track of sometimes, some days than it is to um, teach, especially when things are changing quickly. But if there's enough interest then let me know and I will see what I can do. All right, so Beth is saying yes, Caroline saying yes, Eileen. All right, so I'll see what I can put together. Um, yes, 
I'll get back to you guys on that. But I, I do know it's something people are asking for. Um, I know some people, I know some companies and people who have done Facebook webinars and things, but even they, they, they've done like a short kind of challenge, but things have changed already since then. <laughs> and so I don't even have a great resource that I can point you guys to, but I will look at doing something that is current for right now and see how that works. Because I have to say, I truly do love Facebook ads. Um, Facebook is a pain. I will tell you, Facebook is not always the most user-friendly platform. However, it is a great way to reach a broad readership. It really gives you a lot of opportunity. And so I think that's really important. And um, I think it's a great way to reach readers. And that's what we're all about is, you know, reaching our readership. All right. Nice. All right. Margie's in two and L. Oops, what was that? Yes, Facebook has security risks. Um, all, yes, <laughs> yes, but um, all platforms have security risks. I think I actually talked about last week about my client who um, had a very large Facebook platform that was hacked. Um, it was not, it, she was taken advantage of and gave, she gave access to her Facebook account, um, which was unfortunate. It was a very, very well done scam. <laughs> um, which is really just unfortunate. But I think for any of your platforms, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, Amazon, Ingram Spark, really the important things with all of those is as much as it's annoying, as much as we all hate it, I know we do. Two-factor authentication can really help if you have concerns there. Um, watching your accounts regularly so you know if anything weird is happening, keeping an eye on your bank accounts or cards connected to your accounts um, regularly. I don't know. Most people, I don't think, like actually keep a checkbook register anymore. Maybe that's why like so many younger generations have a problem with debt or budgeting is because we no longer actually look at our money the way that you know, people used to. Um, but checking those things regularly, I often will tell, you know, authors have a card that you connect just to your author accounts or your social media accounts so that you you have an idea of what's happening when and if there's any weird charges, you know, to change it immediately. Um, the other thing is, is being careful of who you give access to. Now, I will say that I am trusted often with people's passwords for different accounts. And I'm so um, honored that people trust me that much, but usually that comes after working together for a while and protections being put in place. You can make different people an admin on your Amazon ad account so they can run your accounts, but not touch your credit cards. You can do the same for Facebook ads. You can set someone up as a business manager where they like you can kick them out at any time. So there are things you can do to put in place and just be really careful. Never, ever click a link in an email. Never. Always check the email address and what it came from and make sure it matches that, that platform. Like there's a list of emails from Facebook. You can go and check what, um, what domain they're coming from facebook.com, facebookmail.com and different things like that. You can go and you can check and you check that against the email address to make sure that whoever's sending it to you is legitimate. It does take being smart. It does take caution, but I, I hate to see fear hold people back from potential book sales because there, there are these opportunities to market and to sell and if we don't take them out of fear, then we're really only hurting ourselves. And I absolutely understand. I understand risk and, you know, it's a pain when your credit card gets hacked or when an account gets hacked. Um, but there are ways to mitigate those risks. And so for most people, I think it's probably worth it as long as you're smart and savvy about it. Um, let's see. Um, Good question. So Mark's asking if I get a new cover for my book. So if my book cover maybe needs a little, a little zhuzhing up or a little love and I'm getting a new cover, should I do a whole new book launch? If you are going to republish with a new ISBN, possibly. If you're just doing a new cover, I wouldn't necessarily do a new book launch. 
The reason being is that your book launch usually hits your warm audience, your friends, your family, your social media, your newsletter list, and they've already kind of seen the book. So you can announce you have a new cover and kind of share that, but I wouldn't necessarily go for a whole new book launch, especially if the book isn't that old. Um, if you are doing a new edition and it's a new book, let's say you have a foreword added or you've added content, a relaunch makes a lot of sense. Um, but depending on how much you're changing, again, a book launch very often is focused on your warm audience and they've already seen the book. If they wanted it or if they were supporting you, they probably already bought it regardless of the cover. Now, as far as can you relaunch your marketing activities, your ads, your, uh, you know, reset your social media and with those ads or um, book cover in your website, absolutely do that. But depending on what you mean by book launch and the activities that you mean, um, it may not make sense. Yeah, so media reviewers and different things like that. If you are relaunching with a new ISBN and you have a new launch date, you can absolutely reach out to media or um, different places. There are some book specific media like trade reviewers that will not accept a book again. So for example, um, what is it? Is it book life that doesn't like some, if you're doing a second edition or an updated edition, like some of those trade reviewers won't even consider your book because it's not brand new. Um, but a lot of them will, and a lot of the media and trade reviewers, you can pitch for those and different things. And I would absolutely take advantage of that. If you're doing a new ISBN and a new cover, set a pub date and market it, market it to the people that you haven't hit yet. And I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Going back to security, um, Caroline saying that she uses a password vault called NordPass. Uh, I use one similar. There is, I mean, there's quite a few NordPass is one, LastPass is one, um, and you can give third-party access to sites um, without them being able to see the password and revoke access if you're working with someone, as well as to keep all your passwords. Um, again, I have had relationships with some of my authors for years and years, and um <laughs> I had one author who they're, they they got sick. They got sick. They ended up in the hospital. Uh, they're fine now, but they got sick, ended up in the hospital. And um, their wife contacted me and was like, I don't know, like, I'm supposed to be paying things and I don't know how to do this or that. And I'd worked with both of them very closely and um, got permission from the husband to share, but it was just so, so funny that we don't often think about like our access or remembering passwords or what happens, what happens if you get sick or someone doesn't remember. Um, and it can be a mess. So password vaults are really nice for that because also you tend to have one login and one password for all of your accounts. So that way, if you uh, have a problem remembering all your passwords, you only have to remember one. I do recommend that that one is uh, very strong and it's got all the randomness in it, but I can remember one account login. Actually, I remember a surprising amount. Let's see, I think logins and passwords are like my memory bank instead of phone numbers, like we all used to memorize phone numbers, right? Like someone asked me the other day, do you remember your childhood phone number? And I rattled it right off. Of course I do. Do I know, this is so bad. Do I know my sister's phone number? Like who I talk to all the time? Uh, no. no, I could guess. I know the area code and that's about as far as it goes because we just don't remember these things anymore because we don't have to use them. All right, let's see. There is another question here I wanted to pull up. So let me look for that. And if you have questions, just drop them in the Q&A and I am happy to answer that. Let's see, where was that question? It's in the middle. It's in the middle of a whole email. So let me see if I can find it. If not, I'll have to be more organized next week and answer it then. 
Um, oh yeah, so it was the question I kind of touched on it. Summary titles are being pulled from Amazon and Overdrive. Um, and also a lot of those summary titles and um, summary titles, full AI titles, low content titles being pulled from Overdrive, Amazon. Drafted Digital is now pulling them. Barnes & Noble is pulling them. Ingram Spark has been pulling them. So that is nice, especially for nonfiction authors, because this happens very often, um, that nonfiction authors and books, they'll put up a book and within days, they'll see a summary title of their book. Sometimes it's like literally the first couple of chapters of their book. Sometimes it's an entire outline of their book. And then someone sells it as a summary and they usually make a cover that looks very similar to the original cover. So it can be confusing and then people buy the wrong book. And really it's just people scamming and praying. And so that is being you know, cut down on a little bit, which is really nice. I think it's needed in an age where we are so happy that it is easy to publish essentially. <laughs> I didn't say, oh, okay, maybe not easy, it is quick to publish and it can be done easily, uh, much more easily than, you know, creating a book and then having to go and have it printed and then put it up for sale on different sites and different things like that. Print on demand has made things really accessible. That's the word, not easy, accessible. And so because it's so accessible, people are abusing it because there will always be, there will always be those people. And that's why we can't have nice things. And um, so people will definitely scam on that. And I think that it's good that the retail platforms and things are acknowledging that and doing something to protect that, even though it may cut into their bottom line and it may cut into their profits. I think it's all about keeping, number one, keeping scammers out. Like we want to protect people's information, authors work and that kind of stuff. And also um, as well as just, it's all about the consumer being satisfied and happy. And I think that we definitely see that as well. Um, a question coming up, Kim is asking, um, there was an author, there is an author who is fairly well known who has recently been, uh, shared in a lot of author groups and things and sharing on TikTok because KDP, um, she is saying, I do, I have not seen these documents. I'm assuming that she's being honest. She has no reason not to be, but I am just relaying the story. I don't know for sure, but um, she is saying that KDP sent her a notification saying that there is a question of the copyright of her book. And so therefore they were not going to allow her to publish on their platform. And this author, it's a third book in a series. The series has done very well. She's done a lot of marketing and uh, KDP has said, Hey, nope where someone complained that and claimed this copyright as theirs. So we're not going to allow you to publish the book. You have to prove that it's yours. And she obviously was upset, but she sent in, you know, her copyright paperwork, her U.S. copyright and sent it in to KDP. And they said, nope, that's not enough. We need a contract from the publisher, but she's self-publishing. And I've seen this happen more than once where um, it seems, again, it's it's not totally clear, but it seems like in this case, some, some person actually claimed her book as theirs and said it was theirs and um, put up a question of copyright. And that is just... Um, that's just a mean-spirited person at that moment. And, um, but there are those people out there anyway. So now she's running into, they're requiring a publisher uh, agreement or a publishing agreement between her and the publisher, but she's self-publishing. And I will say, I've seen this multiple times and what has worked every time I've seen it, what has worked is that the author Simply, if they have an LLC, they write a contract between the LLC as publisher and themselves as author. They backdate it to whenever they want to, and they set that up, and they essentially create a contract between themselves and their company. Or if they do not have a LLC, they are still whatever publishing imprint they're using, they simply create a contract between themselves and themselves, and that has worked several times. Um, so I think that is 
probably smart to have that in your back pocket. That is one of the reasons why, even though you don't have to have a DBA or an LLC when you're publishing, you certainly don't have to, but it's one of the things that could protect you down the road simply because you can write a contract between the company and yourself, even if you are the company or you own the company. Um, and so that is just something to think about. These things are rare. They don't happen very often. Um, they can usually be resolved in, in my experience, if the work is truly yours, if you don't have anything shady going on, you can usually get it resolved, although it will take some time and, and it's a pain. And whether it be simply because KDP is just doing their due diligence and for, for whatever reason, your book raises their red flags, or if it's because malicious intent and someone puts up a complaint about copyright, they again have to do their due diligence. They have to protect themselves. And so it's all about following the steps and the rules and going through the process. And um, in most cases, I've seen these things resolved positively. Um, and if not, then I don't, again, I'm not looking at these documents. I don't know if the people had the appropriate information and the appropriate rights. Um, so that is definitely going around. I think it's so interesting now that we have things like TikTok and Facebook and Instagram where people are sharing so many things and um, authors are resharing these things. I think it's so interesting that we're hearing about these cases more far and wide um, because it's not just authors talking about it on forums. It is authors talking about it in author groups and then the author sharing with their readers and their readers sharing it. And it's becoming just so much bigger and well known, which I think is super interesting, just how it's becoming a, a more social thing, that publishing has become more social. It's become um, more of a community, even if it's between the, the author and the reader, opposed to just authors and authors or just publishing. For a long time, publishing was very closed off. If you were not in the publishing community, if you were not in traditional publishing, you didn't know about publishing and no one was going to tell you. It was like a guarded secret. And I don't know why. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I do free advice Fridays, because I think that we should have information. I think the more we know, the, the better off the publishing industry is as a whole. And that is why I try to share information so freely, because the more educated we are, the better decisions we can make, the better our industry will be, in, in my opinion. Uh, but anyway, that was a bunny trail. Those, that was a hopping bunny, by the way, in case you didn't get it. Um, let's see. All right. Yep. Caroline's saying, I'm getting a lot of interest on Instagram, but we'll let you know if it transpires into sales. I used a promo person, bloggers, et cetera. It was a feel-good scenario, so that was good. Absolutely. It's nice to see that you're getting some of that kind of PR attention and stuff onto your books. Make sure, I know on Instagram, you can't really link to things unless you're running ads. So just make sure that in your profile, you do have a link to your books because that can help convert to sales there. Yes. And then other Caroline is saying, I've had this problem with copyright issues due to pub the book being published in the UK and the contract works every time. Um, and I realize that it's not a human typically, it's AI bot doing reviews. Yes, 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 and yes. Um, I say this every time someone gets a frustrating reply from Amazon or a frustrating reply, you know, your book's been earmarked for an issue or um, you're not getting a response and people get so frustrated. And I think it's really important to realize that very often, a lot of these companies are using AI essentially to respond to a lot of inquiries. So a lot of um, issues that are sent in, the response initially very often is going to be from some type of AI or it's literally someone reading a script. It's going, it's someone going to the help page and copying and pasting what's in the help page. And then you're frustrated because you're like, no, I just said I tried that or that's not my problem. Aren't these people paying attention? Well, no, they're, they're really not. Um, they're going, okay, the question was about copyright. Let me go to our help page, type in copyright. This sounds close and then they're copy and pasting it over because that's their job. They're not really paid as higher management to think about things. And so you have to keep on sending in and following up 
to get to either higher management who deals with the sorts of things or um, a real person. It's like, we've all done it where you're sitting on the phone and it asks you questions and you're pushing the numbers or it's saying, how can I help you? And you're talking and you're like, I don't know, I'd like to order a pizza. And they're like, we're sorry, we don't sell bacon. Like, no, that's not what I asked. And you're getting frustrated. Then you start hitting zero over and over and over again in the hopes of getting a human. That's kind of what you have to do when you have any type of issue with a lot of these publishing platforms. You have to kind of keep on hitting that zero, keep on sending those reminders to get to the right person. Because very often the initial contact is not, um, it's not always the higher level people that can help you and um, they're not being malicious. Sometimes it's a AI bot and you just gotta go through the process to get to the end where you wanna go. Anyway, all right. We have about five more minutes left. If anyone has any other questions, I think I've run through the questions that I was emailed um, today, but if you have any more, please let me know. Um, I will be here, ooh, ooh next Friday. This is a, <laughs> look at me processing my calendar as I am talking. Um, yes, next Friday, I think I'm going to be on a plane on Friday morning, which I didn't even think about. So um, as many of you know, I am going to be, um, I'm doing a conference with Alexa Bigworth in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we are running that conference um, October 4th through the 6th. And I do, in fact, fly out on Friday the 4th at 7 a.m. So, so you all know, we will not have Free Advice Friday next week. I will be flying in the air. So we will not be here next week for October the 4th. We will absolutely be back for October 11th. So just so you all know, you're welcome to come get online next Friday, but I won't be here. Um, maybe then you can go get some writing done instead, but we will be back on October 11th. Yes, I am so excited. I have, um, Caroline's going to be there. I have a couple of other people that I have worked with for years. I, I feel like I know you. I've I mean, I do know you, but I've never met these people in person. And so I am so excited um, Caroline, I hope you're a hugger. And um, if not, I'll like, I don't know, I'll like fist bump or do a hula hoop move in front of you in excitement. It'll be great. Um, but I can't wait. Um, so we will not have Free Advice Friday next week. We will have it the week after. And I've got one more question from Elaine that popped up that I'll answer before we go. And the question is, do we need to have a copyright on our covers? My designer put one on, but I hadn't had one before. You typically do not need a copyright on your cover. It would typically go inside of your book. So on the copyright page. Now you may give credit to your designer there, but I don't usually ever see a copyright, like the copyright symbol on a cover design. And really when you're buying that cover design, you're you're essentially kind of licensing the, it depends on how it is. You may actually be buying the copyright. Uh, you're certainly buying usage. So most of the time, no, a cover does not have a copyright symbol on it. It would just be on the interior of the book and it's for the actual words in the book. You may give design credit on that copyright page for the cover design as well. Yay. I am so excited. All right, everybody, I'm going to let you go. It's been a great Friday. Thank you for being here. And I will not see you next week. I'll see you in two weeks. For anyone who's going to be in Charlotte, make sure you find me. I will be ecstatic to see you. And uh, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>